Ah, ben, j'aurais dû à 1h15. Please come in. We're going to wait a little bit. For We're going to wait two minutes for people to come in. Just checking my, Mac, my, my mic that way. Uh, alors. Okay, I think uh, we're about to start if some more people want to come in. It's hard after Bourlange huh? <laughs> to pick up a session, have the same level of energy and passion. Uh, but we have a great uh, topic today. It's about uh, the impact of a connected world and uh, eventually some global governance to make sense out of it. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but I mean, most of you, I'm sure, are very aware of the hiccup this morning with the time, because uh, the time wasn't changed. It was supposed to change, so everybody's completely confused. Nobody knows when his flight is at. It's just a total mess, and that's that's a recipe for a connected world. So it's a, it's a great way to to start our panel today. Uh, maybe some of you are aware, but according to IDC. Our digital universe will be made of 180 zettabytes. That's a word I've never pronounced before. Zettabytes by 2025. And what it means, a zettabyte, it's 800 followed by 21 zeros. So I don't see if you see the amount of data that digital universe is. And it would take about 450 million years to download it in one stream. So huge amounts of data. The more it goes, we all know that the more interconnected we are through our phone, our mails, our websites, our social networks, but also public infrastructure, such as a commuter train, or even personal appliances like our toaster. Most of us, and me included, have given out freely our personal information in exchange of free services that we can hardly live without today. And this wealth of information has created, in turn, a wealth of new businesses and services. It can be better targeted advertising, for example, or specific services that have been developed thanks to artificial intelligence. Uh, we can also foresee that with the advent of new smart cities. So some see data as a new set of uh, asset class. Some see the happening of an infonomics market, where you would, would, which would be led by how much data is worth. Uh, but a lot of yet is to happen. For now, we know that data tells a lot about each and one of us, and we also know that firms and governments don't necessarily look at it the same way. So to explore the wild, wild west of this connected world, uh, we have this morning, alors, next to me, François Barrault, who's uh, chairman of uh, IDAT DigiWorld, uh, Mr. Chang Daewan, who's chairman of Make Your Media Group from South Korea, uh, next to him is Francis Gurry, uh, the Director General of the World Intellectual Pro Property Organization. Uh, next to him is Patrick Nicolet, who's the Group Technology Officer at Capgemini Sogeti. And finally, Toby Simon, Commissioner with the Global Commission for Internet Governance. So we're going to start uh, with usage and uh, François Barrault, how all that interconnected world really changes our habits and the way we're doing things. Thank you. Uh, I'm lucky because uh, I had my first computer in 1977, um, and I could be an actor. I've been uh, also a programmer. Uh, I've been observing the evolution of technology, but I'm not going to talk about technology, all the buzzwords, IA, uh, cloud, but I will uh, talk about what are the influence of technology on the way we live, we communicate, and we, uh, we operate on a daily basis. The first thing, and I say this on this stage, which is more important than ever, the big revolution that technology has brought to us is the access, the instant access uh, to knowledge. Knowledge has been an asset uh, discriminating uh, the poor and the rich during centuries. And at the end of uh, the beginning of 2000, through blogs, through uh, Wikipedia, it became an asset share. And all of a sudden, on an estate basis, everything was uh, shared 
through blog and through uh, so some website. So what does it mean for the people? When you keep information for you during ages and you share it, it creates new reflex. You share your car, you share your home, you share your apartment, you share your office, uh, you share information. And what does it mean for the business is if you share your car, you know you have business like Blablacar popping up. If you share your experience, you take pictures, you share with your friends on the various uh, uh, social networks what you do. Uh, it, then you can rent also your apartment through Airbnb. Um, I have a team right now looking for an office in Paris. Uh, there are 10, and the three offers they got was not traditional office, but co-location. So what does it mean for business people? Is it totally changed the way um, they have to operate. Carlos Ghosn really explained very well yesterday. During many years, car makers were producing car. Now they are going to produce a service to go from A to B. Another thing which, is, uh, uh, which has a big impact on our life, this morning you should have all received the statistic on how you've been using your, your iPhones. Because we're reasonable people, we have had maybe 100 uh, interactions during the week. But some kids in the US, they have 500 connections per day. So what does it mean for the brain? Instead of delivering a thought process during four hours, but what you, we used to do, reading a book or whatever, every seven, 10 seconds, the brain is attacked. What does it mean then? It means the neuronal topology of the brain is being reconfigured. It creates addictions. It creates also a new form of depression, and it creates also some avatars. I organized a board uh, uh, three weeks ago with 14 people, and I told them no iPhone during four, four hours and no tablets. And it was funny to see the reaction of the people, because after 10, 20 minutes, some of them were really in an addiction mode, like cigarettes or alcohol or whatever. So uh, little by little, this uh, interaction with the brain become um, uh, an, uh, an addiction. Another impact also is we all communicate on a daily basis, on an asynchronous basis. We have friends who are overseas or families or whatever, and we share experience. So the more we communicate like that, the more we need to be together. So a new set of business are exploding, music concert, sports, sports bar. And now in Paris, as an example, you can see in London, after work, hundreds of young people hanging around, around, um, uh, around the bar. Uh, one thing also which I've changed, technology has changed in our habit, is the way we shop. We, we have all e-shop. But what are the impact on the network of shops? All the corner stores now are doing very well because it's convenient. All the big shops are big more like Apple Store is an experience, so you go there and hang around. But the in-between shops is not convenient, it's not fun, and uh, it's not an experience. So except the Apple Store where you go there to hang around, as an example in London, 35% of the commercial surfaces between 400 meters, square meters, and 8,000 meters have no, uh, have no future. Um, another example is entertainment. Uh, we. In our younger age, we were buying LPs, CDs, cassette, DVDs, and whatever. And now, nobody buys cassette. You go on the net, you have Netflix. And not only that, but now, all the young generation do not, lack, do not look at TV, on the linear, the linear TV, but are looking at um, uh, Netflix and things like that. So my point here, and I'm not going to, to describe everything, that little by little, not only the technology changed the way we operate, but change also our relationship with things, the way we operate. That means because the change is very fast, the impact on the traditional business of CapEx and OPEX, it will create a huge paradigm, which is very difficult to, to anticipate. And Carlos Ghosn yesterday really in phase of facts. So just to, to finish, what is next? In the next 18 months, there will be three main revolutions that will even change more our life. First of all, the speed of communication will be multiplied by 10. So the 5G or the 5G plus will move our communication from 100 meg to 1 gigabit or 10 gigabit. Second, the next generation of sensor, IoT, uh, quantum computing 
will make the things much faster, much smaller, and in a few years from now, you will have a chip in your body that, like a plane, will reset all the data and say, you can work, you can sleep, you can drive, and whatever. And last, the next generation of algorithm will take in the cloud all the programs, aggregate it on a real-time basis at the speed of light, and then <clears throat> we'll provide uh, in a real time, on a real-time basis all the algorithms to make the things faster and cheaper and whatever. And here, and we're not going to talk about artificial intelligence, all this change, the day it will be faster than our human reflex, then we can talk about IA. Just a, a, a data, uh, the speed of um, uh, internet is about 300,000 kilometers per second, is the light, you know, it's speed of light. In the brain, the speed of data, you know, is 100 meters per, per second. So there is um, a competition right now between the brain and between the process of watching things and operating things as a reflex. Mm -hmm. So is the fut future bright or not? I don't know. But we need to be very careful about how do we use technology because it impacts our life, the way we communicate, and we need to be very careful with our kids to make sure they still have a normal life and play with toys like we've done when Wooden we were toys. younger. toys, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Francois. Well, this is a good uh, way to introduce our next panelist uh, because you're going to talk to us about smart cities and, of course, the, the, the augmentation of speed, the new sensors. That's going to change drastically the way the urban life uh, change and you have specific example in what yeah. is happening in South Korea you can talk to us about. Let me uh, go to the podium and talk. Of course, <laughs> please. After much confusion of uh, weather and timekeeping, time I'm finally here to deliver my uh, speech today. Uh, it takes a long time to come over here, about 12 hours to Paris, then another three hours to Rabat. And, uh, you know, uh, my newspaper has done a lot of research and uh, provided some suggestion to important global issues. Uh, for instance, uh, in year 2013, uh, with special interest in cities, uh, I have a, a declaration of a modern city uh, for Seoul and Busan. Those are two major cities in Korea. And today I will present case studies of Korean smart cities. I'd like to point out that smart cities are emerging as global connectors that can solve problems that nations cannot. Uh, if you look at this uh, graph, uh, the cities have grown expensively with high concentration of resources and smart people. Consequently, cities have grown faster than nations. Uh, if you look at the case of United Kingdom, uh, London grew much faster than uh, UK as a whole, and Washington DC did that too. In contrast, nations are becoming more divided as seen in the events like Brexit and protectionism in the United States. And many smart cities are you know, popping up all over the world. Sorry. Okay. Uh, about 152 cities are you know, spring up here and there. And uh, global companies like Amazon, Google, and Alibaba uh, they have their own ideas uh, to make uh, smart cities here and there. And Saudi Arabia, uh, which gets a lot of attention these days, uh, government has recently announced its $500 billion smart city project. It's called NEO. Okay. So uh, many of these governments and uh, global companies are initiating uh, smart city projects. So what's the definition of a smart city? Okay. A smart city is referred to as a city whose infrastructures are connected in a network through information and communication technologies, which is geared towards improving the quality of the services in energy, transportation, medicine, and education. 
What are the uh, technologies for smart city? And uh, we have just talked 5G. 5G is in uh, practice uh, very soon. And big data and blockchain technology uh, that will uh, have lots of impact on our lives and AI and robotics. Also, we have a city as a platform. Uh, you, you have heard a lot about building proper infrastructures are crucial for establishing a smart city. Such infrastructures, for example, Hyperloop and 24-hour remote control medical service and even flying car roadmap, these infrastructure constructions need to be done in the direction that will both sustain and improve the qualities of human lives and business environments. 19th century, you know, introducing car was a big thing. It was a platform number one. And 20th century, we had a smartphone. That's a platform number two. And now I think uh, smart cities is platform number three. And cities are emerged as third platform. Smart city, okay. Uh, I try to call Idea City, uh, coming from Plateau. Uh, Idea City means uh, you have a digital twin, so everybody can join the digital twin and suggest your own ideas. And then finally, decision maker, mayor or vice mayor, they have an Idea City, Idea City. Plateau never thought it was possible to realize the notion of Idea. However, in the Idea City, it becomes possible to realize such a future city in the three-dimensional cyberspace. Many of urban problems will be simulated in virtual city to find the most suitable solution. In order to achieve a smart city, you need a digital platform. And many countries, Estonia, Finland, and Andorra, small country, uh, they are going uh, under uh, many of their uh, digital platform. Okay. Estonia successfully turned its administration into a digital platform and issues e-residency to any interest people around the world. I'm an e-resident in Estonia. I can open up a bank account and I can even set up a, a company there to do business around the world. Andorra and Finnish city of uh, Kalasatama both are transforming the entire state and city into digital platform. I have an interesting picture here. Economy grows together with urbanization. Okay, look at the Korea. Korea grows well with urbanization rate. Also Thailand did this, did this so. But if you look at the Italy, uh, it looks somewhat uh, stagnant and uh, now they are uh, throwing away money to relatively poor people and it will bring them more stagnancy. And China, China has an economic development strategy which is uh, urbanization uh, of the backward countries here and there and they had the high speed railroad, highways and the uh, far away company, they are doing quite well with the 5G and also Low-cost carriers, low-cost airlines are changing in Asian space quite a lot. Okay, case of Korea, we are uh, commercializing 5G uh, in this year, so that will uh, change uh, many Korean lives. Virtual reality and uh, uh, many things will be, will be changed. Now I turn to uh, some uh, smart city uh, project happening in Korea. Uh, we have a capital city, new capital city for administration, is aiming to make a map of human emotions through neuroscience and big data analysis. Now the neuroscience I mean, you, uh, is a big thing uh, everywhere. Uh, for example, if a person who feels distressed uh, gets in a self-driving car, the person will be automatically driven to a right place for relaxation. <laughs> relaxation may be a spa 
or drinking joints or movie theater. But if you end up uh, watching a sad movie, you will be more depressed. So I don't know how we're going to have this uh, emotional problems uh, together with the artificial intelligence car sharing system and 5G data analysis space. Uh, in other words, uh, city Sejong is building an emotional data platform. Many platforms are being built in South Korea. And go back to, uh, go to Busan, uh, it's named Echo Delta City. Uh, Eco-friendly smart city of water. Okay. Uh, this is quite interesting idea. Mm. The temperatures of water at the river beds are lower than the outside temperature in the summer and higher during the winter. Therefore, if the water from the river beds can be utilized by the buildings, energy can be saved. Okay, Busan City is now collecting various data of water quality and quantity and temperatures for water management so that it can construct eco-friendly resources management data platform. Sounds interesting. I don't know what it can be realized. Uh, not only governments uh, carry out smart city projects, uh, I know there's a private company uh, initiated city project. They call it Green Energy Data Platform. They have solar energy panels and smart grid system, and they want to invite many uh, startup companies uh, from overseas. Okay, uh, there are many benefits of smart cities, but I talk about three benefits. Uh, quality of life, economic dynamics, and sustainability. Uh, we like to enhance uh, these factors through smart city projects. Smart city is a key to maybe global governance. Let's look at the Switzerland, Juke. It's a very small city, small town, uh, where cryptocurrency initial coin offering was first implemented. New jobs surged. While the whole city population remains at 30,000 people, 40,000 jobs were created due to a formation of a virtual city with a digital platform that deals world crypto transactions. Also, Estonia, a country with a population of only 1.3 million people, predicted that its e-residents will reach 10 million by year 2025. These examples show how a digital platform can solve the small population and low employment problems. Yesterday, we talked a lot about the problems of North Korea as nuclear ambition. But North Korea is a very uh, interesting country uh, when you talk about smart city. Uh, it can become a smart city test bed because it's very poor and there's nothing much. And so if North Korea, Kim Jong-un, really abandons its nuclear ambitions and the United States lift up economic sanctions, uh, there will be a lot of things happen. We had a Japanese professor, he talked about the uh, uh, war reparation fund uh, they have in Japanese government. Uh, that's almost like uh, 80 billion US dollars, if I remember the numbers correct. Okay, since North Korea does not have any regulations on expansion of the fourth industrial revolution technologies, it is the most suitable site for applying my idea city. Moreover, Korea has the experience in proper technology of exporting a new city construction model. We've done a lot of construction activities in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, South Korea uh, has lots of experience building new towns here and there, even in Iraq and Iran. Idea City will not only solve the underdeveloped problem of North Korea, but also be able to contribute to peace and prosperity of the world. Finally, <laughs> we have uh, four uh, 
global leaders here. Okay, President Trump. He's a real estate developer, and I'm sure he likes to convert Manhattan into a smart city. But he hasn't done, say, done said anything, but uh, sooner or later, in his Twitter, uh, it might come out. And Xi Jinping of China, okay, he, I already said he wants to urbanize the backward region of China. He's already building smart city between Beijing and Tianjin. It's a huge project for him. And Mr. Kim of North Korea, he wants showcase uh, to show his people that uh, he's uh, 38 years old or something, but uh, he wants to tell the people he's doing very well and he's the great leader after his father and his grandfather. And South Korean President Moon, he's designated two cities already, and one for administration, the other one for eco-friendly Delta City in Busan, and another project he has now, after meeting Kim Jong-un, is a peace town, building a peace town in military demarcation region between North and South. So leadership is very important carrying out smart city projects. All the global smart city examples I've talked about earlier were possible because of the political leadership that drove the projects forward. I think we are living in a connected world. Smart cities will connect the world faster. And smart cities will make the world decentralized. So I know that uh, President Trump, he has big idea that uh, America first. Now it's turning to America only. But uh, I don't think his ideas will be that successful. Uh, he'll face blockchain, AI, and all the new technologies that will challenge him. So good luck with him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> We're very happy that you found a, a, a good way for Mr. Trump to occupy his time by building a smart cities uh, instead of doing uh, other stuff. Um, this is a good, uh, actually a good, uh, way to go to uh, your presentation, Mr. Nicolet, because we're going to talk about politics, geopolitics and data. All of this, as I'm sure you've noticed, is a little intrusive because if according to Francois, I'm starting to have sensors in my body, and if you're mapping my emotions, uh, that doesn't leave me much room left. So Mr. Nicolet, if you want, I don't know if you want to be on the stage or stay here. Fine. You're fine, so it's up to you. Thank you, thank you, Virginie. Uh, so, yeah, uh, what I want to focus on is uh, what we define as the geopolitical importance of uh, data. So, first, uh, a few numbers on uh, on data. Uh, there is an explosion of data production. Uh, it has been the production of data has been multiplied by 20. Uh, is forecasted to be multiplied by 20 between 2015 and 2025. The big part of this will be uh, data generated by machines, not only human interaction for sure. The volume of cross-border exchange of data has been multiplied by 45 between 2005 and 2014. And it's, uh, it shows the, the, the importance of it. And then the infrastructure that support this, uh, called cloud computing, uh, was covering less than 30% of global data in 2010 and will cover more than 50% by 2025 considering that there is, from a geopolitical standpoint, an imbalance already uh, because the big part of this infrastructure is controlled by uh, US companies and uh, now, more recently, uh, with through big investment from uh, Chinese companies. So what, what, what does it mean for us? And, and I will try to give uh, some of the pattern we see about the, the strategies or the priorities given by, uh, by key by key geographies and countries. Uh, in, in the US, very clearly, there was no uh, government direction, but US firm went after wealth. They, they were the first to identify that data was a source of wealth, and they focus on generating money. That's what you read about the GAFAM, uh, the Google, Apple, uh, Facebook, uh, Microsoft. 
and, and uh, they are. You look at their market capitalization these days, you look at the, the volume of CapEx. The big cloud providers can spend uh, up to one billion of capital expenditure per month. It's not only on cloud, it's on software, hardware, on, on all the services they develop. This is a formidable force. And so they are, they are going after this uh, and, and creating these wealth, which give them uh, extraordinary means to take different action. In, in China, if I would look today, uh, it's more about the power. It's not so much about the wealth, they will go after it. And uh, one good example is uh, China's social credit system, uh, which is the use of data to uh, rank citizens. Uh, based on data that you can collect on them, and then you, you, you define add it, you, where you add some information that you get from the community, and then define to, uh, which kind of public services you can access. Uh, even if you can have a passport, if you can go out of your region, and if you have a passport, if you can leave the country. So there is a huge of, of data around uh, power. If you look at uh, Russia, uh, I would uh, make a shortcut and say it's more uh, an intelligence-based uh, use of data, including uh, deception. Uh, you see it in the intervention, and again, uh, I have to be careful because formal attribution has not been done everywhere, so uh, I have to be careful, but there are evidence of interference in uh, election in the, in the Western society. There is a, a way also about how you use uh, data uh, not only around fake news, but uh, to create real uh, disinformation campaign. And, and Europe has given what we would expect the classical social democratic answer, uh, which uh, the symbol of it is a new regulation called GDPR, which is a protection of uh, privacy related to data, considering that uh, what I often say is that we try to manage a schizophrenia here in Europe, because the consumers have given already all their data uh, without uh, many consideration on their privacy to the big American players uh, first and foremost. And, but as a citizen, they are asking protection, they are asking now the right to be forgotten, etc. And, and uh, Europe, and I don't say it's unnecessary, Europe has responded uh, uh, this way. And that, that creates, we, we see this a clear imbalance about, my, in my view, about what we do and, 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 and uh, related to the importance of data and, and how this will shape uh, eventually. And this will, in my view, fundamentally influence the relationship and the, the, the geopolitical relationship. Uh, and, and I would propose, to be practical, uh, three areas where we might uh, want to focus on. And uh, the number one is the redefinition of trust uh, through uh, technology. Uh, trust is fundamental to all human interaction, be it business, be it between state and everything. Technology is fundamentally changing the way trust will be handled. Part of trust will be in technology. Uh, the relationship of the citizen to trust, if you think of a platform like Airbnb, how is it that you would let foreigners uh, sleep in your bed just because the platform is telling you that it's okay to do it? So we, we see these changes in the way people approach, including the relationship to uh, their government, to their authority. And there is a, an element of mistrust because uh, through fake news, we discussed it last year, by the way, at the World Policy Conference, this is creating, uh, 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 again, uh, a difficult path uh, forward because you don't have the trust within your own nations and then you have to build trust with other nations in the context that I just described. The, the second thing, in my view, the second topic, and it's, it's one that is hard uh, to, to start uh, upon, and I know it looks like a buzzword, it's around ethics. I, I think we underestimate the importance of this uh, discussion when it comes to artificial intelligence. And I don't speak of transhumanism because it's an extreme and people can say, yes, we know, we know. But how is it that we had an extensive debate when uh, biotechnology cam came and here, probably because the level of abstraction is too high, we don't have it, but this creates fundamental questions about how you are going to design the technology and the technology solution uh, going for, uh, further. And the, and the last point, obviously, is how you are going to govern. Uh, and I know this will be addressed, probably, 
by you, uh, how you govern uh, these elements. But uh, I take one example, and I know Toby will develop on it, and I will finish on this. Uh, take cybersecurity. I mentioned it briefly this morning uh, during the Young Leader panel, but it's a real issue. Uh, th this is the Wild West. Cyber warfare is going as we speak. All, all our, in, our companies, corporations are attacked as we speak right now during the entire day. And then we, we eat something new. There is no regulation, nothing. We, we just have to protect ourselves. Uh, it's a cost of doing business. It's a cost of operating your administration. So it's a tax that comes on top uh, uh, of it. The reason is that wealth is moving uh, online, obviously. But uh, we need something to govern. And I want to mention one practical initiative uh, that to which uh, we'll adhere to. Uh, it's uh, uh, the general counsel of uh, Microsoft, Brad Smith, has identified this problem a while ago and has launched an initiative called Tech Accord, which is an industry-wide initiative where people can join and promise that they will behave appropriately, to be defined, and then also to create a, a kind of Geneva convention for the United Nations that will set the rules of engagement, as we had to do it uh, in, in war. Because this is cyber warfare, uh, what is happening uh, on top of uh, cyber criminality. And uh, just to finish on this, also to be concrete, uh, and to mention because you were the WPC, we have launched with Thomas, who is here, uh, a study with the IFRI that you can find here on Europe, subject or object in the geopolitics of data. So you will find here more information. We will continue with a workshop, so, and, and we will continue to work on this, because I think this is a, a theme, a topic, that, is not, uh, uh, that didn't get the level of attention it should have. And I, I tried to explain that there are already broad implications. We don't see it. We don't pay enough attention, in particular in Europe. I think uh, our partners are much more aware of the power of data than we are, and uh, we should take con uh, conscious of it. I'm happy to take uh, questions afterwards on some of my statements. Thank you. It's, it's a very sharp contrast with the ideal world of smart cities, where everything's you know, for eco sustainability and growth, and the world you, you're describing, that it's much, much more worrisome. So, Toby, maybe we can address that little confusion and imbalances uh, is there a way to put some governance into this? Thank you. Thank you, Virginie. I want to first thank Thierry uh, Song Nim and the organizers of the World Policy Conference for inviting me to be a panelist in this session. Uh, I would like to briefly share the objective, state both the paradox and the challenge, outline four key issues that I believe will have a bearing on the way we live in a hyper-connected or connected world. With the permission of the chair, I would also like to touch upon uh, the need for effective global governance as a means to optimize the benefits of a connected world or otherwise be prepared to face the collateral damage. Let me state the objective first. Basically, it's to identify the gap between yesterday's structures and today's complex problem in a connected world. And here lies the paradox. Globalization, while it is the most progressive force in history, can also be the cause of the most severe crisis of the 21st century. Consequently, citizens will see integration as risky and could become xenophobic, protectionist, and nationalist. So what is the challenge? It's quite evident. The challenge is the future is unlike the past. Our capacity to, uh, to manage current global events has not kept pace with the growth in the complexity and danger of those events. At the national level, the biggest challenge for politicians worldwide <coughs> and policymakers is the need to balance the enormous benefits of global openness and connectivity with national priorities and policies. For example, the need to protect local jobs and local industry. Let me also state about the, state the four uh, issues that I wanted to speak about. One is need to repurpose global governance with respect to global commons. Okay? And this is spoken in, in many forums, but i just like to shortly describe this. The repurposing of global governance to meet the new challenges is vital. 
Nations are divided and cannot agree on common approaches. And within nations, there is no consensus or leadership on critical global issues. The number of countries now involved in negotiation exceeds more than 200. And the complexity of, the in, uh, of these issues have become multifold. The interconnected has grown and has, has, and has as much as the effect of media and pressures on politicians. So what is the tra tragedy of the global commons? It's something that we had in the past. It is the over-exploitation of common resources. Like we had herders in the past, no single person has the motivation, single person or government has the motivation and the responsibility to limit the number or extent of grazing of livestock and so the res these resources will eventually collapse. For example, the internet. It's a shared global resource and cyber criminality is a common threat that requires intervention both at the global and national level. One cannot fight cyber criminals who transcend national borders with justice systems that are constrained by na national jurisdictions. Number two, cyber attacks could trigger massive outages in a hyperconnected world. I'll give the example of WannaCry, which all of you know. WannaCry ransomware was a cyber attack that targeted machines running the Microsoft Windows operating system. We all know that it affected companies and individuals in more than 150 countries, including governments and large industrial organizations. Now, let us closely look at the vector. First, the attack was on the British national healthcare system, the NHS, then on Spain's largest telecommunication company, Telefonica, went on to the French car manufacturer, Renault, Russian cell phone operator, Megaphone, US-based FedEx, an attack on the Ukrainian state power company, the airport, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, the Ukrainian central bank, the aircraft manufacturer, Antonet, and on to Maersk, one of the largest shipping companies in the world, TNT, one of the largest packet forwarders in the world. The attack also extended to Russia's biggest oil producer, Rosnet, and Sangoba, one of the largest industrial companies in France. So is there a narrative behind this? For us, it's a signaling. And the signaling and the messaging is quite clear. In a hyper-connected world, the adversary has the potential and ability to attack or disrupt an industry, a government, or a critical infrastructure anywhere in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the red flag. And what you saw was only a signaling that it could be done, which means we can expect something a little more harder in the coming months. Second, digital wildfires in a connected world. In 1938, when the radio became widespread, thousands of Americans were confused by the adaptation of a H.G. Wells book, The War of the Worlds, with a news broadcast that jammed political stations, uh, police stations and the telephone lines in the panic belief that the U.S. was being invaded by Martians. Okay? It is difficult to imagine that a radio broadcast can, co uh, can cause a comparable misunderstanding today in part because broadcasters have learned to be more cautious and responsible. The media is more regulated and listeners have learned to be more savvy and skeptical. But the internet remains <coughs> an uncharted territory, fast evolving. Social media allows information to be transmitted around the world at breakneck speed. While the benefits of all this is obvious and documented, our hyperconnected or interconnected world could also witness rapid spread of fake news and fake narratives, either intentionally or unintentionally, which can lead to misleading or provocative positions with serious consequences. The chances of this happening exponentially in this world today is far more than when the radio was introduced as a disruptive technology. Radio is a communication of one to many, while the internet is that of many to many. And finally, digital democracy. Elections are the cornerstone of democracy. We have touched upon this. They are made vulnerable by both information technology and cyber attacks, as we saw 
in Russia, in India, in Europe, in many parts of the world. Advances in information technology are also transforming the democratic systems. Power in, over information has become decentralized, fostering new types of communities and different roles for government. The increased involvement of people in political debates is evident on a greater scale on social networking sites such as Twitter and Facebook. The internet allows for greater freedom, allowing citizens to challenge and criticize a fundamental tenant of democracy. Let me conclude. Global leadership governance in a hyper-connected world has become distributed and collaborative. We are all part of much a broader problem-solving network with many high-performing individuals and organizations, public and private, working on different parts of different problems or on the same part of the same problem. I reiterate, global governance is not about leaders charting their own course anymore. They are about helping networks solve problems with the best and the most current thinking that is available. I conclude again, collaboration is the new competition and the more valuable our contributions are, the greater our influence will be in a hyper-connected world. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I'm glad you had a little positive, po positive note in your conclusion, conclusion because I was completely freaking out. But this round table is really going downhill. Every presentator is seeing something worse than the other. So uh, Francis uh, Gurry, we're hoping on you to bring back something a little positive in that. I mean, I don't want to you know, fly away, scare it out of my mind. Um, can we make, I mean, we definitely understand there, there are a lot of risk. There's a question of trust. Is it possible to, we definitely need to find new forms of governance. The idea of putting networked intelligence together is kind of, I mean, it, it gives me a little hope. Uh, what, what do you make of it, Mr. Gurry? Well, thank you very much, Vir uh, Virginie. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, thank you also to Thierry de Montréal for uh, this invitation. Uh, look, I'm not going to be such an optimist, um, I'm oh, afraid, well. <laughs> um, but n nor a pessimist uh, necessarily, uh, but I'll focus more on the problem than the solution, uh, because I think we can't design the solution until, until such time as we have a thorough understanding of the problem, and we're getting there, I think, but I'm not sure we're completely there. Now, I would say as far as the in impact of the connected world on global governance uh, is concerned, well, the greater the connection, um, the greater the dependence that is created. Uh, and the greater the dependence, the greater the vulnerability and risk. Uh, and so I think we've seen that, and it's been described on the panel this morning by many persons. We see it, the risk to privacy, which is playing out in the policy discussions and the governance discussions on uh, the protection of personal data. The risk to business assets, it's playing out in terms of how we deal with uh, espionage, or cyber espionage. Uh, the risk to um, the integrity of data, which is playing out in the folk, uh, fake news uh, area. The risk to uh, security, which is playing out in the cyber warfare area. So uh, I think that uh, something we can say about these risks is that they are qualitatively different from the risks of the past. And they're qualitatively different uh, for several reasons. First of all, because they are international in character. And that's just an obvious thing, of course. Uh, but it's not the case with risk uh, frameworks of the past, necessarily. Uh, so uh, the second is that they are occurring at an accelerated speed. And that has been mentioned again by others. And the third is, I think, that they're very radical. And that's, I think, an, a, a, a product of the accumulation of, of knowledge. I mean, Sherlock Holmes says in one of his books, you know, knowledge begets knowledge as money bears interest. And that's what's happening, of course, with the degree of uh, knowledge in the world. Now, our institutions, I think, were designed for a completely different risk framework than from these risk frameworks. Um, and uh, if you think in terms, since uh, we've been speaking about cities, if you think in terms of the walls of a city, a walled city uh, is one governance response to the sort of risks that were out there. Now we have a completely
qualitatively different sort of risks that we are confronting. And that is causing, uh, I think, radical disruption in the efficiency and the efficacy of our governance institutions. Uh, uh, because they were designed for something else, frankly. And we can see that in many different ways. I'll give you one example, uh, which comes out of the nature, what, I, I mentioned three things where I think, which differentiate risks these days in the connected world. One of them is speed. Um, and coming out of that, of course, we find ourselves confronted with a series of situations <coughs> which our institutions have not had the time to reflect upon and consider. So uh, for as long as we live in a world in which you can do anything except that which is expressly prohibited, as opposed to a world in which you can only do which, that which is permitted, and I'm not advocating a change, but for as long as we live in that sort of a context, then science and technology, particularly with the speed and with the accumulation, are going to be way out in front of our institutions and the design, that were designed for dealing with different nature, uh, uh, different risks, different risk frameworks. Uh, and there are many, many examples, but I think the effect of it is that uh, governance is reverting increasingly to the market and technology, or if you like, in order, it's reverting increasingly to technology, which is actually determining social directions or the direction of society, uh, and business models are built by the market upon that basis. Nothing to do with governments. Uh, and you can see this in anything from relatively trivial examples to major, major examples. Let's just, I can give you one from my field uh, very, very briefly, which is music. So in the last 20 years, there has been a revolution, of course, in the production, the distribution, and the consumption of music. Everything has changed. Uh, now, we have reached a situation in which in the last two years, for the first time in 20 years, the size of the music industry worldwide has, has grown uh, as opposed to reduced. And digital sizes, digital market sales rather, are increasing. That situation was produced by the market, not by governments. And I'm you know, saying that as someone whose job is to supposed to get international cooperation around solutions for this sort of a situation. It's been produced by different and accessible, more accessible business models. Uh, so we have a situation in which a lot of governance and uh, a lot of social direction is being set by the market and technology, regardless of ideologies, just as a consequence of the speed and the radical nature of technologies. Uh, and uh, when you come to the international solution to that, since one of the features of the new risk framework is that these risks are international, of course it's much worse than the, at the national level. It's much slower than at the national level, uh, but we have, of course, international problems or risks, uh, if, you, uh, if you like. Um, and in addition, at the international level, I think, uh, one of the things, and this comes back to a bit with one of the things that points that Toby was making, where I'm not sure I'm in total agreement with him, uh, what uh, we see at the international level is that these areas of risk are also the areas of competition. So let me give you the example of Ebola uh, and the World Health Organization. Now, it's relatively easy in the World Health Organization, relatively easy, to get a unity of purpose about the suppression of Ebola because everyone's interests are the same. We all want to suppress it for different reasons. That's not the case in science and technology because it's the center of competition between countries. Uh, and this is a, uh, you know, a newer feature because it wasn't always so much the centre, although I'd argue it's often been near the centre. So that's one thing. And secondly, it's also the centre of difference. It's the centre of disparities. The great disparities in the world are produced by uh, technological differences in technological capacity. So we face a situation which is a perfect storm in many respects. New risks different nature, 
they're, they're stressing and disrupting our governance institutions that we've known because they were designed for walled cities or to just take an extreme example, different situations. Um, and difficult to move forward because this is also the area where uh, we have huge differences and the area of competition. So um, I would say, if I may just make one or two small uh, points, uh, other points. Um, these two factors, that is, that science and technology and, and are really the basis of competition and also the basis of the hugest, the biggest disparities, uh, this is producing a, a situation in which I think uh, it's a contribution to the movements that we see towards uh, unilateralism as a policy um, a posture rather than multilateralism. Uh, because if you're going to be competing, you go to your national basis to compete. So they're yeah. contributing also to these movements we're seeing towards uh, uh, nationalism, uh, national approaches, uh, unilateral approaches as opposed to multilateral approaches. But on the other hand, it's also the case that because of interconnection, that the first mover, provided it has scale, uh, is going to be determining the global rule. And I think that we see from, uh, I think it was Patrick who mentioned the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. So the European Union has moved first. And the scale of the European Union is such that the, the whole world has to comply with it. Now, it might be different if some a small country, an island state, uh, introduces the regulation, but when it's the European Union. And furthermore, uh, there is a growing pressure, which we've seen over the last couple of days, um, with Tim Cook, for example, from Apple, speaking out and saying, well, the uh, United States needs to uh, develop a regulatory framework also for the protection of personal data, plus the social movements on, on the internet all produce a situation in which uh, you know, influence is being exercised in a different way and it's being exercised by the first mover. And I'm not saying that the EU deliberately chose to do that, but that's the impact uh, these days of an absence of multilateral, a reversion for lots of reasons to uh, unilateral approaches. Uh, but we will also see that first moves are made by China and first moves, of course, are made by the United States of America despite its non-regulatory uh, culture. Um, so, this produces a situation which I don't think is very optimistic for risk management in where we have a completely new set of risks uh, to deal with. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, I would say we really have to rethink our governance uh, models, uh, re really radically rethink our go governance models to deal with new forms of risk. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, I'd like to try something here. First, I'm going to try to summarize quickly what I think is the three solutions of governance you're proposing. And I'd like you to vote on it so, and see what, you know, what is the one that appeals best to you. So if I go to you, Francis, you're really the liberal one. Uh, that's the guys doing you know, the new technology. They, they're going to find the way, the scale to put out the, the good answers. Uh, just. I'm not sure why, but because uh, at least they'll have the power to implement at some point. You say uh, it's the risks are super important. We need a, some kind of a new government body. You're much more confident, you, Monsieur Nicolet, much more confident in multilater multilateral. It's a hard word for me to say multilateralism than than Francis Gurry is. And you, I think, have a very different approach because it's none of those two. It's Let's take the intelligence where it is on the network. Let's try something really different. It's, it's provide governance within the network with the intelligence we have here. So we have something very spread out uh, with taking the best of what we can provide eventually. That's, let's say it's A, it's you, Toby. B, Mr. Nicolet, which is uh, let's try to put some sense, organize it the way we know how to do it. And basically it's a super body, you know, with new laws and try to, 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 to um, stop the risks. And you, it's, and uh, C would be you, Francis. Well, I described more than endorsed. I'd okay, say, say. okay, anyway, so it's not yeah. yours, but yeah. he, the description of Mr. Gurry's, which would be uh, coming out from, from the <laughs> actors. So let's say, uh, 
what do you think is the most likely to happen, if you don't mind helping me out here, but uh, do you think Toby is, is, is on the right path? Do you think Mr. Nicolet, and let's start with Toby, do, do people believe that there's intelligence in the network and we, we, can use, we can use it for governance? Does anybody think that here? There's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so let's say, let's say 10 <laughs> to be generous. Uh, now let's go to Mr. Nicolet. So rather more classical solution, um, probably better organized, easier for us to, to apprehend. Uh, a, a new super governing, but so I see one here. Okay, we're a little more comfortable with your solution. 20. Voila, you even have somebody if I here. I apply the same rule, it's 20. Okay, yeah, apparently it's, it's the good one. Uh, and last, uh, I what Francis just described, uh, who, who, is, who agrees with his description of, of the world? And how, and the, 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 the analogy with music was interesting, how, how this uh, whole business changed and evolved and, and set its new rules. So does anybody at all, nobody? Yes, yes, one, two, three, four, five, okay. So I'd say, Monsieur Nicolet, you're, you're first, and, and you, you guys are for a tie, which is pretty good for, for a debate because uh, it's, it, those are very, very difficult questions. So we have 15 minutes left. Uh, uh, yeah, we have some questions and uh, I'd love to take them. Uh, can you pass the mic to this lady, please? And then we have questions in the front. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oui, Sabine Janssen, ma question s'adresse à Patrick Nicolet. Vous avez évoqué les dangers de la, de la guerre qui se fait et qu'on ne voit pas et la nécessité d'imposer de nouvelles règles. Est-ce que vous pouvez revenir sur cette convention de Genève que, dont vous parliez tout à l'heure et que vous appelez de vos voeux Uh, oui, en, 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 en donnant crédit à, à Brad Smith, donc le General Counsel de, de Microsoft. Uh, donc c'est... I do it in English? Or, oh, whatever, whatever you're comfortable donc, pour with. Pour répondre à votre question, c'est un, c'est symptomatique qu'un des leaders euh, prenne l'initiative. Euh, Francis a mentionné l'intervention de Tim Cook. Euh, la, Apple a une position très claire sur les questions de privacy, y compris par rapport à ses propres autorités euh, policières, le FBI notamment euh, aux états unis Donc on voit qu'il y a une prise de conscience, euh, je dirais, qui, qui correspond aussi au type de business model. Il hein. faut quand même garder les choses en perspective. Mais dans, dans le cas de cette initiative, euh, c'est une prise de conscience au niveau de l'industrie. Euh, on, on, on doit empoigner le problème. Et donc, euh, la, la proposition euh, faite euh, par Brad Smith, euh, auquel j'adhère et, et le groupe que je représente adhère, euh, c'est un, d'avoir le Tech Accord, c'est-à-dire, c'est le nom, c'est un, un, une adhésion volontaire euh, d'entreprises, de, de, de tout secteur industriel, donc c'est plutôt le monde corporatif des entreprises, pardon, euh, et on dit, voilà, il y a un certain nombre de règles et on s'engage à se comporter de telle manière. On s'engage à partager de l'information. Je pense qu'il y a un point très important qui a été soulevé sur la notion de concurrence. Et c'est vrai. Alors ça, c'est vu les milliards d'enjeux. Mais euh, le, et pas, pas en cyber security. Il n'y a, a pas d'avantage compétitif. On, do, on doit partager nos informations parce que tout ça nous coûte très cher pour quelque chose qui ne nous concerne pas vraiment. J'appelle ça, je fais la relation avec asymmetric warfare. Donc, euh, et puis l'ambition, la, euh, on verra si elle se matérialise prochainement, c'est de dire est-ce qu'on arrive, une fois qu'on a cette mobilisation de l'industrie, à euh, mobiliser les gouvernements pour qu'eux-mêmes s'engagent euh, dans, un, dans un projet. Il y, a, il y a des travaux qui sont en cours. Peut-être en novembre, on arrivera à présenter quelque chose. On verra. Et, et ensuite, de dire, est-ce qu'on peut aller jusqu'à une, une convention qui engagerait les États Donc, c'est un travail de plus longue haleine. Euh, Microsoft s'est engagé à mettre des, des ressources euh, financières et humaines à disposition. Les autres participants également euh, contribueront pour qu'il y ait des équipes qui puissent effectivement travailler et faire avancer ce dossier. Alors, uh, the, where's the person with the mic, please? You have several questions in the front, if you don't mind uh, taking one. Hello. Thank you very much to the panel for, for your points of view. Uh, so I work for one of the largest tech companies uh, in Europe, uh, Delivery Hero, 
And something which I think is uh, particularly interesting is that in Europe, there are simply not such large major tech companies uh, as there are in the US, as in China. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Nicolay, you just mentioned an initiative which has been <coughs> being led by Microsoft. Uh, so what do you feel in terms of Europe simply not having such a large tech sector as uh, China and the US? Do you feel that in a lot of this regulation in creating this new global governance that Europe might actually not be such a significant voice in, in the future? Francis, would you like to Please. answer? Uh, okay, well look, um, I think you've put your finger on something that's extremely um, important, namely that there are no internet giants in Europe. And it's, um, it's a bit of a paradox. It, it arises, of course, from the cultural and linguistic diversity of Europe. So China has no problem with 1.2 billion. billion people or more yeah. who use the same language, and the United States has its 350 million or so, plus the hege hege hegemony of English, you know, uh, throughout the world. So, uh, and the creation of good business models. So this is, I think, a huge competitive disadvantage because data, as uh, Patrick has said, data is really. Uh, the fuel of the of this digital economy, uh, and um, having access to the data, uh, we may well get good collaboration, but we may well also have a lot of competition. So th here, I think you're right on the ball, and I'm not quite sure how you deal with it. Of course, there are movements uh, towards openness. Uh, we've seen it in open science, in open innovation to some extent, although I think it's a different phenomenon. Uh, but there is a big, a lot of movements towards openness. But there are uh, the opposite also, which is the essence of property, which is the power of closeness. Um, and that is something that we are, that is a tension that we are going to have to uh, live out, and it's the same as the tension between collaboration and competition. Uh, and it's going to be at the centre of our policy discussions and our policy frameworks for this new environment. Mm, interesting. Uh, I think there were more. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Ah, une question. Alors, je me pose une question. Est-ce voilà, que le débat est un débat euh, de régulation ou est-ce que c'est une question plus profonde Je relève qu'hier, on est revenu souvent sur les questions de périphérie et de marginalité. On a relevé des espaces à l'échelon de la planète dits périphériques et oubliés. À l'intérieur des villes, on estime qu'il y a aussi des espaces de banlieue et autres qui sont considérés comme des périphéries. Hélène Arouelère, euh, recteur des universités européennes, a parlé de murs numériques. Et donc la grande question, est-ce que nous ne sommes pas dans une question plus profonde qui est un débat d'éthique Parce que la même question que l'économie et régulation, où est-ce que notre approche économique doit, doit changer On en a parlé hier sur les différentes approches nouvelles des pays émergents. Et si c'est cela, il, je suggérerais qu'avant qu'on puisse avoir un conseil de sécurité qui s'autoproclame capable de tout régler et sur lesquels les grandes compagnies auraient beaucoup d'influence, Est-ce qu'on ne pourrait pas essayer d'inventer une, une, une dynamique démocratique qui commencerait par un sommet mondial d'éthique On l'a eu, cette préoccupation, sur le sommet mondial social, on l'a sur le climat. Est-ce que ce n'est pas plutôt une nouvelle philosophie qui doit pouvoir alimenter Et derrière cela, il y a un problème de représentativité. Très bien. Alors, il y a des questions éthiques et il y a en effet la question de l'exclusion. Uh, I'm thinking about smart cities. People out of those smart cities, for instance, Mr. Day One, uh, you know, th th there is big risk of exclusion uh, in your world of the perfect world of smart cities. Is this something you are worried about? And then the, the whole panel can address this question of ethics that is important. And as uh, uh, our guests have suggested, do we need to have this reflection? Before thinking about governance, do we need a deeper reflection on ethics in general? Mr. Dewan, please. You know, talking about ethics, <laughs> it's uh, quite uh, 
troublesome to me, you know, because uh, these cities I mentioned in Korea, it's a pilot project, and uh, we don't quite really know how we're going to head for a new future. And ethics uh, comes with uh, different cultures. You know? uh, I know there is a basic standard of ethics, but uh, people have different religion and uh, different uh, family education. So it's, to me, it's very difficult to talk about uh, ethics. So do you uh, think, all of us, that there, we, we would need a wider conversation about ethics, Francis, would you like to address this? Well, look, I agree, it's extremely difficult, but I think that with the speed of technological development, we're finding ourselves in a situation in which the law is over there, <laughs> back, back in a different, different reality. Uh, and what's being challenged are the values of a society. So this space between the law and the values of a society, I think, is the space where we need to encourage the ethical dispute, which I think, the ethical discussion, which I think Patrick has, has mentioned, uh, and I think it's exceptionally important, but we're in a world which doesn't have shared values. We ha also have to acknowledge. Monsieur Nicolet? Oui, no, I, I think I mentioned it so, uh, building. I think we, we, if you look, we managed to govern the internet through a foundation uh, based on a set of principles. And, and I, while I totally agree with Mr. Day One, it's uh, just a global ethical debate, I think it's, uh, it's unmanageable. Uh, you can still agree on a certain number of principles. And I think one you mentioned around digital inclusion should be part of what we want to achieve, personally. Now, it has to be debated. And, and then uh, the, the, this notion of privacy. So there are a certain number of topics, I believe, as much as we could govern the openness of the internet, which has been challenged, yeah? notably because of a question of governance, uh, because located in the US. Uh, we have to have a broader discussion uh, beyond the internet. Mm -hmm. If you think blockchain, uh, that uh, Mr. Daywan mentioned, isn't another internet. It's a transactional internet on top of the uh, communication mm -hmm. internet right. that is the original internet. Uh, we, we cannot just say, oh, it's a technology that we deploy. We, we have to. Uh, take this debate again, as we did at the inception of the internet. And I think, yes, ethics is one element, but uh, we, we have to find yeah. principles. Okay, Monsieur Barreau? Uh, je vais répondre en français, parce que la question est en français. <coughs> Avant d'avoir un débat éthique, il faut avoir un, un débat euh, économique. Euh, J'ai fait une présentation l'année dernière sur le digital divide, ou la fracture digitale, ou, qui est non seulement euh, entre les pays, mais aussi intergénérationnelle. Et j'avais fait une, une, une carte du monde de l'accès à l'eau, à la nourriture et au digital. Et comme par hasard, c'est exactement pareil. Il faut se souvenir que Internet, qui a été la plus grosse révolution industrielle, qui a changé nos vies, j'en ai parlé tout à l'heure, mais qui a créé des trillions de dollars de, 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 de valorisation boursière, a été construite sans aucune gouvernance. Aucune gouvernance, ça veut dire quoi C'est que dans le pipe, vous avez des, des data, vous avez des paquets de data, qui sont non discriminés, ça veut dire que vous gagnez 100 millions de dollars sur une transaction, vous demandez l'heure, c'est pareil. Et la création de valeur aujourd'hui n'est pas réinjectée dans le système. Qu'est-ce qui se passe du coup Une nouvelle économie euh, s'est créée, ce qui fait qu'on gagne beaucoup plus d'argent en monétisant les datas. Et ces datas d'ailleurs, on pense qu'elles sont souveraines, elles ne sont pas du tout. Ces datas appartiennent à des entités dont, que l'on ne maîtrise pas et qui les monétisent sur notre dos. Et ce qui fait qu'il y a des créations de valeur absolument incroyables. Et malheureusement, une, une grande partie de cet argent n'est pas réinjectée dans les, la vraie économie, le financement des infrastructures, la protection des données, etc., mais enrichissent des fonds de, de pension essentiellement euh, anglo-saxons. Donc, pour moi, le débat éthique, c'est un, un débat de riches, un débat de chain on the cake. Et je pense que le vrai débat pour moi, c'est l'accès au digital par l'ensemble de la population au même titre que l'eau, que la nourriture et que l'éducation. Quand vous amenez dans un village euh, en, dans, rural en Inde ou en Afrique euh, du digital, de l'accès à la connaissance, vous voyez en trois mois une transformation incroyable des enfants, des adolescents, des, des femmes ou ceux qui n'ont pas le titre de sachant euh, et qui tout d'un coup se, 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 se rapprochent euh, du monde moderne, apprennent, etc. Donc avant de parler euh, d'éthique, pour moi il me semble... Euh, crucial de rebalancer cette 
euh, équilibre économique qui est totalement d'ailleurs euh, concentré. Hein. Vous allez euh, en Corée, à Séoul où j'étais récemment, vous avez un gigabit dans votre hôtel et vous allez dans certaines zones rurales, même en France, vous avez zéro. Et ça, pour moi, c'est une vraie discrimination puisque vous avez, on est société à deux vitesses, en plus des conflits intergénérationnaux, puisque euh, nos enfants ont grandi avec l'Internet, nous, on n'a pas grandi avec l'Internet, et on se fait distancer. Même moi, qui suis à l'intérieur du système depuis 41 ans, eh ben, je me réveille certains matins en disant « qu'est-ce qui se passe ?» uh, Toby, and then, then we'll, we'll uh, wrap up. Uh, I have a quick point to make. Uh, the, the, the whole idea of ethics is going to be very personal. It's something that uh, everybody will have to sort of look back and decide. Even within a family, you cannot define a standard of ethics. A father might have some, uh, the children might have a different one. So how do you start generalizing that you would want to have a co an LCM or a HCF for ethics? Uh, there is a school of thought happening in many parts of the world that it might be hard to trust uh, people, but why don't you trust machines? And, and, and you have uh, a certain amount of technology that is going into blockchain, where the whole idea is don't trust the individual, trust the machine. The machine uh, has a capability uh, to, to more standardize uh, you know, rules and values, so why don't we go by it? So I'm just uh, giving you an alternate uh, perspective. Okay, well I think we've all grasped that it's a very, very complex uh, question. There is really not one answer and, and it's interesting to see that there are a lot of ways to think about it uh, and a lot of dimensions to it, business, ethics, governance. So a big round of applause for you and thank you very much uh, for your attention.